morning or good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're calling in from. Um, welcome to Generations United webinar, What Makes an Intergenerational Community? Lessons from Manchester, England. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Generations United, we are a United States-based organization that works to improve the lives of children, youth, and older people through intergenerational practice and public policies. We work to connect practitioners around the U.S. and the world, and one of the ways that we do that is through these webinars. So this is the second in our series of monthly webinars on intergenerational issues. It's made possible with a grant from MetLife Foundation, and we will be ho hosting monthly webinars for the next five months, and at the end of the at the end of this presentation, we'll have a schedule of some of the upcoming webinars that we already have scheduled for January and February. A couple of quick housekeeping items: uh, everyone on this call is currently muted, and there's some text here for folks that might not be able to hear well. And I'll just say that there's two options for listening: and one is through your computer, and the other is from dialing in on your phone. So if you're having trouble hearing with one of the options, um, we can encourage or recommend you to try the other. Uh, second, um, if you have any comments or need clarification on terminology used or any of the practices, because we're going to be hearing of some of the practices in the UK and the US, please go ahead and use the question function and ask those. As the moderators, we'll make sure our presenter, um, we can interrupt our presenter to let him know if there's any um, any changes that, or any, you know, to clarify any points of clarification. Also, any other questions that you have, we will have time for Q and questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So please, again, send them our way. We will moderate those and make sure that your questions get asked. Um, we are recording the webinar, and the PowerPoint slides that you will be see, see both will be available on the Generations United website. If all things go well, um, tomorrow, but if not, definitely early next week. And then finally, we just want you to take a couple minutes, probably about two or three minutes, at the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a survey. Um, those are really important for us. Your feedback's important. It helps us plan future webinars, as well as um, we do provide the feedback to our, our presenters to help them and as they're developing presentations. So, uh, about to start our presentation today, we're thrilled that we can offer a webinar that was based on a presentation that was delivered at our conference this summer, and for our U.S. audience to share an example of some of the phenomenal work that's happening around the world. Patrick Hansling is the Intergenerational Strategy Coordinator for the Beth Johnson Foundation in the, in the United Kingdom. Patrick's role focuses on helping local authorities across the U.K. to develop their intergenerational approaches. He also currently works in Manchester, coordinating intergenerational practice there under the Generations Together program. Previously in Manchester, he was a community engagement development officer and a neighborhood manager. This work involved developing community engagement and cohesion approaches across the city, leading to new approaches such as participatory budgeting. Before this, he worked as a community development officer for a regeneration program in Bolton and as a community planner in Auckland, New Zealand. We're so pleased that Patrick is joining us today. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to him, and we can learn more about the great work that he's been doing. Okay. Am, am I on at the moment, so I'm all ready to go? You're yes, you are. You're ready to go. Uh, <laughs> okay, and welcome to everyone, although it is always slightly um, strange when you've got 20 people on a list and you're not quite sure who they are or what they look like or how they respond to what um, you're saying. So I just want to put a few things uh, out first. Um, I'm always happy for interruptions and that, so I think that um, Sherry and I are going to look at how people need to ask questions about a context because I know some people aren't from the UK um, who are listening into this. My slides here relate to my conference presentation in June, and I've had some, obviously time's moved on since then, so I'll make reference to these, but I'll give a context of when I want to say either A, I was wrong, or B, maybe here's a way to look at this a little differently. 
and the third thing was the uh, different headings for this. Um, the webinar is presented as what makes an intergenerational community, lessons from Manchester, England, and there was some advertising material around Manchester, a city for all ages, and an age-friendly city of Manchester. So I think what I'll do is I'll touch upon a number of those areas, and hopefully this is a chance for people to learn from my experiences and the team that I sit in in Manchester, the Valuing Older People team, and the organisation I work for, the Beth Johnson Foundation, and the work they do out of the Centre for Intergenerational Practice. Um, I'm, I'm going to make reference to a number of websites as I speak. Now, I listed those on the last slide, so those are there, but I'm going to give some, I'm going to set those out quite early at the start. Um, so if anyone has a pen and paper, if you went to, if you noted down uh, all the W's dot Center for IP dot org dot UK. Now that's the Beth Johnson Foundation Center for Intergenerational Practice website. That's Center for IP dot org dot UK. Now of course you if you just Google Center for Intergenerational Practice you'll get the link. The second website is Manchester one, www.manchester.gov dot uk forward slash generations together. That's www.manchester.gov.uk forward slash generations together. And that gives you a profile of the pieces of work we did under the Manchester Generations Together program. I'm going to make reference to the World Health Organization's global network of age-friendly cities. Now, they've got a long website, but if you just Google that, uh, maybe at the end I can read that out, but it's the World Health Organization's Network of Age-Friendly Cities, and that's quite a long website, um, so I'd just Google that, but I'm sure we can provide that another time, and I think that will be of use to people. Now, I've got here on the front page, and that it was, uh, it was relating back to the Generations United Conference. Um, which is the Generations United International Conference. And if people have a chance to go to the Generations United website, I think it's a really good website. And it also highlights the different range of approaches of intergenerational working that goes on in the States. And I really enjoyed it when I went over there, where I could sort of see the different perspectives and how people in the States look at intergenerational working or multi-generational working and I've used it as a bit of a catalyst for my own thought processes. So I would encourage people to go to that website. And one of the sort of headings of the conference was all participants have the opportunity to rethink and revitalize the future of intergenerational connections, becoming part of something greater for the field. And for me, that becoming part of something greater for the field is how intergenerational practice can fit in this concept of an age-friendly city and the different angles people can come at that. Um, as I said earlier, I, uh, when I gave this presentation, I might have changed things now and maybe I've changed my view. So please always remember some of the things I put forward, I'll try to flag with some of my own thoughts. And I'm not saying all of this works all of the time. And it's all about sharing different approaches, but I'm happy to be challenged in the questions. And I'll always be honest, if I can't answer, I'll say so. And if I don't know the answer, I'll be honest there too. So this was the um, page of the introduction, which I've kind of given you now. And I'll, I'll set out the work of the Beth Johnson Foundation and the Valuing Older People team in Manchester Council. I'll outline the age-friendly city concept, and that's the WHO model of the age-friendly city concept, and look at the role, the connections between age-friendly and the role of intergenerational practice within this. It's always interesting to look first up, I think so, um, at a definition or understanding of what intergenerational practice is. And I'm going to speak for a few minutes about this before outlining the Generations Together program and the Manchester context of that work, where there was 12 local authorities who were funded to do work. Um, uh, intergenerational practice, for me, is quite an interesting topic, but I really like this quote. and. It's um, from To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his, or her, I would add, 
but that's a different time, point of view, until you climb into his or her skin and walk around in it. I really like that, and I think for me, that's if you're looking at it, trying to have an intergenerational practice, it's about enabling younger and older people to really, you know, kind of walk in each other's skins or shoes and experience life from those different perspectives. So I, I thought that was a good quote that can sometimes get people thinking nicely. And of course, you know, you're most happy to use that because, of course, it wasn't written by me. Um, on the um, front, um, uh, on the Center for Intergenerational Practice website, quite up front, there's a um, definition of intergenerational practice. And I said earlier that I think it's quite important that wherever you're working, people really get a good understanding of what their definition of intergenerational practice is and why. I think there's no one answer to any problem or every opportunity all the time, and it's always important to have a local context. I wouldn't spend years and years over definitions, but I think it brings up a lot of points of taking the time to understand and think, what do we mean by intergenerational practice? And of course, the Beth Johnson Foundation offers some training where people can learn more about intergenerational practice and how it happens. Just putting a bit of a dig in there. And uh, contact Louise Middleton if you want to learn more about the Beth Johnson Foundation's training. It's a really good opportunity. Um, the Beth Johnson Foundation's definition, um, it brings people together in purposeful, mutually beneficial activities. Um, it promotes greater understanding and respect between generations. And it's inclusive and builds on the positive resources that young and old have to offer each other and those around them. And why I like this definition is because I think it's actually quite concise. Um, but I also highlighted in black some of the areas where there can be the most um, debate or discussion around the idea of intergenerational practice. And um, I'll just give a quick check. Yes, that's all right. Sorry to jump around there. Um, there I just want to have a quick thing or just flag these words. Um, brings people together. Uh, people, we often mean younger and older people. And if I sort of opened the mic and asked all the attendants, I think it's 25 people at the moment, to say, what's the definition of a younger person and what's the definition of an older person, we could have a whole multitude of different perspectives. And that's why it's always important to have a very good local perspective on why you have these definitions and what was your rationale or reason behind having that. So the people for the Beth Johnson Foundation, um, you look at people over 55 or within Manchester over 50, and that's on up to 100 or, and beyond. And younger people, it's often 12 to 18 and 12 to 20, a bit more, um, which of course highlights the idea of what about the younger people, all that sort of thing. But that's a good starting point, I think. But I think it's really important around intergenerational work to remember when you're working with people, are you talking about younger and older people? How, how does that group define themselves, or how are you imposing a definition? And are you mixing across different generations where you're using these blocks as a starting point? It's about purposeful, mutually beneficial activities. Um, purposeful is important because there's lots of examples of intergenerational practice that work so-so, but could have been better if it had always had a clear purpose. And like anything, all the participants must know why they're coming around to do something. And one, it benefits both younger and older people. It's not just um, an area that, where one's to fix the other generation or maybe fix a problem to the other one. It's where each gains and has a more equal power relationship. It promotes greater understanding and respect between the generations. And that word respect, I think it's important, we're not saying that we don't have discussions or disagreements or question why things happen over generations, but it's how we have more respect for people um, in our different generations and in society, and that's quite an important point. And is inclusive and builds on the positive resources that young and old have to offer each other. So that's all about looking at that younger and older people, bottom line of our work is that they are positive in society that they are good, and we're not out there to fix the problem youth or 
that it, that those old people blocking up hospital beds and creating problems. It's about looking at maybe how society's these issues could be addressed. But our bottom line is that younger and older people are coming at something from a positive angle, and that's really, really important. I um, popped in the slide in the presentation. I might, I probably wouldn't go back to it quite now, but at the same time I will. But I often think it's really important to think about um, the role of culture within intergenerational practice. Now, traditionally, for example, Maori culture and Marais, for example, have it much more embedded into that culture that is naturally intergenerational, both between younger and older people who are related and younger and older people who are unrelated. But sometimes that can really differ between communities. So what might be a norm in American community or a Maori or uh, Pacific Island community might be different from your more traditional white British or English community or Indian or Pakistani. So sometimes the role of culture can have a massive impact on how people, people look at generational relationships. Um, so I think it's something to always consider and look at your participants in your um, city or community or where you work in, don't forget it. Um, the media, I think we probably all know now how the media has a massive impact on how we perceive younger and older people. And sometimes um, you can get there between from older people to young, even before they've even met, based on what they've seen in the news or read about things. And that can sometimes be a massive barrier, and that's an area I'd always consider. What's the role in your local area? What role does the media play? And what messages are they giving out about younger and older people? Um, societal norms, I can't remember what I was going to say about that one, so I'll skip that. Um, the car, that has an impact on how our public spaces are. Um, and I think it's quite important to remember that as moment, and certainly in England, the cityscape is different because of cars as in the numbers of them and how the space is used. So that has an impact on how, how younger people can play or children can play on streets, but also damage to streets maybe where cars park on footpaths. I'm not anti-car, but I think it's quite important to look at how our street environment has changed over generations and the impact that it has on children and young people, but probably also older people too. And not forget politics and power. Um, I think it's always important to remember that we're always living in a political context and sometimes um, initiatives are driven from either a left or right or mid-range and understand where political parties come from, but also the role of power in society and how younger and older people can often end up having things done to them and where they're not empowered to make a difference in their community. And I think it was Michael Foucault, the philosopher, who made reference to the quote, knowledge is power. But for him, power was being able to define what knowledge is important. And that really always stood for me. That it's just really thinking of who's in power or control. And sometimes that's, that can make all the difference. And the person who's coordinating it, we have a real responsibility as catalysts in societies to sometimes you know, take a lead, but also not let go and enable people to take the lead themselves. Um, Manchester Generation Stick Program. Um, intergenerational practice has um, been developing in the UK over a number of years, 15, 20 years, in the States a similar amount. Um, and Beth, the Beth Johnson Foundation really worked with the um, government at the time, uh, back in 2007, 2008, to help bring together different government departments to fund a demonstrator pilot, um, a pot of money where local authorities or councils in England could bid into to become demonstrator sites for intergenerational practice, to take intergenerational working in different ways and to have that evaluated in a formal structure. And the Beth Johnson Foundation was really influential in that process. And the product that was developed was Generations Together. And that formally ran between 2009 and 2011. And it was a pot of money where local authorities could about $700,000 for those in the US who are listening. And that work, um, there were 12 local authorities who were successfully funded. And the, that was out of nearly all local authorities 
because I think it's about 142 local authorities in England. So that was a big coup in a point of pardon. And uh, Portsmouth and places like that, and you can see how they carried out their intergenerational work and what they did over two years. And I love that work and business context of how intergenerational practice can be interpreted and how it can really happen in different communities. So the foundation, the Centre for IP, had a role in setting up this um, structure, building on the history that the foundation has on intergenerational practice and the resources that are available. And it's now having now had a look at how different processes were evaluated and we commissioned the foundation to evaluate, evaluate the Manchester Generations Together program. Um, in the context of man the day that where the preemptions we ran, um, you'll see evaluation report, and you'll see also an intergenerational toolkit. Now, this is designed to be read in context with the Beth Johnson Foundation's guide to intergenerational practice. Um, so, those are the documents that you'll see there. We had the the intergenerational projects, the idea was that we had, um, but each one would stand on its own. So, for example, we did a program with the Manchester School of Architecture, to design community work for people to recruit. We had food man allotment. And call project. We we had ending project. We had to work on gay trans youth work looking at. Shares coming together at themes and under this. And so we are learning to generate more practice. There are a number of went just to get you. It's real. A lot of young women. Um, the Fugle School, a cookery book from that, was fantastic. It helped bring together different culture, people of different cultural backgrounds, but it was for all participants so rewarding. And the evaluation report is on the website where people talk about the impact this had, but also you'll see the cookbook. And if people are looking at intergenerational working around the states, an allotment is like a community garden. And I really think it had. It was one of the ones where I never thought it would be so powerful for people, and it really was. And that the second part to that is connected was the Food Futures program, which is a Manchester program all around a whole number of things, but around food, healthy eating, um, cooking, growing, understand where our food comes from, and that was taken from an intergenerational pra uh, practice perspective. Uh, another standout, and I'm not saying I'm having a standout, I'm not saying the others were worse, but some real standouts for me for listeners, community radio, where younger and older people did broadcasting together. And that was quite interesting because it helped enable the wider community to really listen to intergenerational perspectives and had a media outlet that was a little different, that wasn't demonizing young people and older people, but actually showcased their talents and skills, but also enabled a way for proper debate to happen, an inclusive debate. So the community radio element, and that was with All FM, um, that's www.allfm.org. I I'd highly recommend that and to work with All FM. We did work with the with urban design, and that was with the Manchester School of Architecture. 
and that was a fascinating project based on a partnership a number of years before, which is still going, where um, students looked at urban design responses from a, an ageing, an age-friendly and intergenerational perspective. And we got some real change around how allotments, uh, the community gardens are managed in Manchester. And we got some fascinating results in terms of actual design and labour sharing the city link, which is on the Generations Together website, because the work of the students is incredibly exciting and it gives perspectives that someone like me could never give you. I would really encourage that. Um, all the other projects were different. The mental health one, for example, a different approach. And our mentoring befriending program with the Manchester Adult Education Service. The coordinator of that was one of those people who you seldom met. It's just, it was an amazing coordinator. His report is excellent, Charles Flake. And that's another I'd really encourage people. But of course, look at all projects. So that's written up on this website. And the idea of this work was that we learned from it. We engaged with a lot of younger and older people. But we really learned from our processes around intergenerational work, including actually how long it can take to engage younger and older people in the toolkit and also the evaluation program. And I'd encourage people to go onto the Centre for Intergenerational Practices website as well to look at the other local authorities who are funded under Generations Together because they come at a whole number of different angles. And also on the Centre's website is our case studies of intergenerational working. Now, um, I seem to be going, okay, I've had no questions, so stop, but you make no sense. So I'll carry on for about another 10 minutes, uh, 15, give or take. Um, I think learning-wise from IP, and I think maybe I should have worded the slide a little better. I mean, I think there's lots of ways intergenerational practice can be carried out. And it's an approach in, in an arsenal of building social cohesion, social capital, sense of place, personal resilience, skills, reducing isolation. It's a really fantastic approach. But I think it works best when it's seen as an approach not in its isolation, but as in within a number of other programs or areas of work that are all about empowering communities and helping enable younger and older people to improve their lives. And I guess the context of Manchester, which I didn't really talk about, it's a poor city. Um, life expectancy is lower than um, many other cities in the UK. Uh, people, older people, for example, suffer from much higher levels of depression than other areas. And even they walk slower, um, and their health in general is much lower. Um, for younger people, the educational attainment um, is lower. and the schools and the educational outcomes are often no lower than the national average. So, I mean, it obviously isn't the worst place in the world because I'll choose to live there and have a kid there. But we're working in a really challenging environment where poverty has a massive impact on people's lives. So our context of intergenerational working in Manchester, that's an important backdrop to remember. And each of the Pat, other oh, cities... I'm sorry, Patrick, can I just interrupt yep. you for a second? Could you just yep, yep. Um, tell a little bit more about the mental health and LGBT programs? Sure, yeah. Um, the LGBT program, that was first, was actually quite a simple one. It was based around the big lunch. In Manchester, there's been historical activism, not just around the women's movement, but also around raising the profile and the rights of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender communities. And there's the famous um, Gay Village. And we worked um, with Out in the City and the Lesbian and Gay um, Bisexual Foundation in Manchester to try to look at how younger and older people could, who are gay could come together, explore how issues affect them today, what it was like in previous generations to be gay, um, and whether or not they could come at all bisexual, whether or not people could be out and freely walk around the street, say hand in hand, say two guys or two women, or what their experience is now, and how maybe they could work together in the future if they, people felt that there's a generational need within that. And the big lunch was all about a simple piece of work where we're trying to bring people together and to have intergenerational discussions. We, we then used the findings to feed into our um, program in Manchester City Council on, um, in the equalities team, but I know the foundation then used their work to try to bid for funding to do extra work. Now it builds on work, for example, in Out of the City, Out in the City, sorry, where it looks at raising the profile of LGBT older people 
and there was really a different angle. And I think that's I think it's quite an interesting way to look at equality is how historically things were in the past, how they are now, and to make sure we don't rest on our laurels because sometimes you can if you sit back things can regress and the areas where younger and older people can work together um, in the future to make change and improvement in equalities. So that was quite a simple piece of work around bringing people together around the event. And the other project was with the Roby, which sadly with government cuts was really hit, but they brought younger and older people together um, and learned different approaches around mental health and well-being in the past, the stigma associated with it and also work with people who have suffered mental ill health in the past and currently, and train them up in different um, resilience skills where then they work with younger and older people in the community to build up resilience. So it's about trying to train up a group of younger and older people um, in mental health skills and to then to be able to enable that to them to deliver training in a community center. And that worked in some ways because it helped younger and older people to explore in many ways the stigma around mental health that is often viewed, but I think in some ways it was quite hard to recruit and it was a program that probably needed longer than about the 20 months that it ran for. And the biggest issue in a way was the Roby who had its massive funding cuts, which uh, it's, was quite a tragedy. But we're happy to share information and learning on that if people would like a little more. Is that okay? Would people like a bit more on that? Okay, I'll take that as a okay. Yes, yeah, that, that's good. Thank you. Okay, it gives me a chance to drink my hot vimto, which is a marvelous English drink. It's fantastic. Um, lots of sugar. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's the kind of learnings around intergenerational practice. And what in Manchester, what we've really looked at doing is trying to bring intergenerational practice now within an age-friendly city context. We have, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the champion, a councillor, local authority champion for intergenerational practice, and we have two members who are champions on the older person's agenda. Um, so within the Valuing Older People team, uh, which sits in Manchester City Council, we led our um, so application to the World Health Organization's network of age-friendly cities. And part of the strength, I think, of our application was our intergenerational learning. And this age-friendly city concept is fascinating for me, but also could be contentious for some possible listeners to again of who we're talking about. And the, if you Google World Health Organization and age-friendly city, you can get a lot of resources from the website, including audit tools, and a sort of guide of what the World Health Organization is talking about. And just Right up front, the, def the perspective of an age-friendly city really is focused on older people, so that for us is people over 55, 50, but it has an intergenerational arm which enables us to work with other communities and groups, for example, young people with the new valuing young people people and then errands with the exploration if you know excited and what compassion on in Manchester social and social so there's a lot of stuff under there Setting current, they bring in a number of agendas, and in Manchester's part, a lie and a partnership with the Beth Johnson Foundation and the Centre for Intergenerational Practice that we all want to be part of. Uh, um, 
sort of a uh, house it anymore. Going in the uh, our approach is through starting it it is a um a a spread uh, this is, it might be a bit confusing about what's meant by this. Um, for example, one's looking at older people telling stories of the past in children and their experience now and how regeneration can have a negative impact and how the wider community needs to hear this voice and how they can work with younger people to become more involved and active in their community. It's actually a really exciting piece of work and one that I've never thought, I've been really surprised by it and I could talk by it for half an hour. So that's our work with the Design Lab students. We're doing some work with, with Southways Housing, a housing provider where we've recruited a post to work in two years around Old Moat to all, um, do a number of programs of work around age friendliness in Old, old Moat. We're developing our cultural offer around how um, older people, for example, can access culture. So, for example, the Halle Orchestra going out to sheltered housing schemes. Sorry, just taking one more drink there. And all areas of our VOP work are either, either building on the past. Um, so VOP, Valuing Older People, has been operation since 2003. Um, so we're consolidating that under the age-friendly banner. Or, and then we're bringing in new programs of work and pieces of work. So I'm happy to provide more information direct through people through email or as we update our website. But intergenerational practice is a very important part of this. And I would go to the World Health Organization's um, website and have a look because um, I think it's actually quite fascinating. Um, now this may bring in a concept and people ask me, is there a conflict between the World Health Organization concept of an age-friendly city as being older people focused rather than wider ages? And here, I'd say, I think in Manchester, for example, it's quite clear um, that the, it's been led by the valuing older people, so the push of it is from an older person's perspective. Firstly, that if places are made more age-friendly for older people, they are made it more inclusive for all. But we also have our intergenerational arm, where we want to work, for example, with youth services. And that's the creation of the new Man uh, valuing um, young people team in Manchester and we want to share all the learning from our valuing older people team when we have a board and forums and local networks to shape the development of youth work in the city so it can work alongside by side so as the city is made more child or young persons friendly so too are we communicating with each other and working really efficiently. So I think it's about if whatever angle or definition you use you make sure you join up and you don't work in isolation. I think there's some discussions around um, cities for all ages, um, child-friendly approaches, um, bring in, bringing in the life course, understanding how people age from life to just being even to being good parents to right till we die um, and approach to look at. And I think the best job I would on examples of the World Health Organization's work. I would look at the centers, Center for Intergenerational Practice. I'd go to the Generations United website and take a look at multi-generational working and shared spaces and look at taking your own approach, but really understanding and having a justification of why you're doing that. And is this being driven from yourselves? Is it with local people? Or is it a mix of approaches with the private sector, with councillors, all that kind of thing? And on this page, I also talked about a sort of question, I think it might have been from Stefan White, the lecturer at the Manchester School of Architecture, who talked about as a sort of really needing to understand um, how we experience a place differently as we age. It could, might have been discussions with Alan Hatton Yo, who's the chief, chief executive of the foundation. And it's how do we understand people in our communities? 
how do we deliver services which reflect local need, but also how we empower communities to make improvements, address poverty uh, through their own accord, and to work with the private sector and the central government to make change happen and address poverty and social exclusion. Um, you can't Google it anymore, but I'm happy to send it. It was around the work around we did around a sense of place. Wherever I go, there I am, but where am I? Understanding that idea of place, belonging and identity. It was work I worked on in New Zealand and in Bolton and also in Manchester over a number of years and we developed toolkits and resources. And I think that might be interested to um, people who are listening. And that's something I really happily share with people. Um, and I think overall this idea of an opportunity to rethink and re revitalize something greater for the field. Intergenerational practice really can be varied. And I look at it from an angle of you've got to have a local approach, but try to look at how other people have done it in the past. And that's really important. And then always as you drive the work forward, know why you're doing it and who you're working with and that your participants know the sort of rationale for this work. That's so important. Whether it's an age-friendly city based on the WHO concept or something different um, around a child-friendly city, for example. You've really got to have that local approach. And at, the, at uh, Manchester, we're happy to showcase our learning on intergenerational work and our work on the Age-Friendly City program, especially that Design Lab student work and all the other areas, but also with the Centre for Intergenerational Practice on the learning around that. That's really important. I did have two quotes to left. left. It's very simple to make things difficult and very difficult to make things simple. After hearing me talk for the last 40 minutes, people might go, man, he's being complicated. And I do like to be simple and then being clear why you're doing it and doing something where you can really showcase the change or impact of the work. And my definition of sanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. Try to always learn from your work. I know we have lots of things that influence how things happen, government, politics, the economy. Heck, I try not to look at a newspaper at the moment. But it's all about learning from what you do and making changes and tweaks from that. And I think that's so important to always question why things are happening and ask participants to question things and to evolve things over time. Nothing stands still. Um, here's my contact details. Now, just the thing I'm finishing with the foundation. This is one of my last days in the office. Um, a lot of my work um, at Louise Middleton um, is a good point of call, louise at bjf.org.uk, and of course Alan Hatton Yo, alan at bjf.org.uk. The website, centreforip.org.org, though the sense of place one isn't working so well at the moment. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions now or at the end, and if people want to email me. Um, and I hope that's been of use to you. I'm not sure if I've completely answered an intergenerational community element, but I hope I've taken the lessons learned and I'd encourage people to go to the Centre for IP's website because the case studies there are all about lessons of how intergenerational working can be done. And of course, it's not the only thing the Foundation does. It has a number of other work areas. And I think that's important to see intergenerational practice as part of a wider context. So I think I'm done. I'm losing my voice. Thank you very much. And I think I'll hand over now. Thank you very much, Patrick. We have received some questions, so I'll go through those one at a time. I'd also encourage folks to continue writing in <coughs> questions. So Patrick, our first question is um, that, there's, that someone would be interested in hearing more about the sense of place idea. Oh, OK, yeah. Um, that, I've got to go for this couple of minutes I could the context to this. This was originally developed in Auckland and New Zealand where we had a, a rapidly changing city. I don't know if anyone's been to New Zealand. It's a long way away. It's got four million people. And we had a city where one million people, those four million people live. And for a number of years, that was quite sort of, not monoculture, you had Maori culture, but you tended to have one white British. Um, uh, so Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, across Asia, Japan, China, um, all the stuff. And that brought together lots of different cultures and communities, from food to dress to music. And so in the council, we looked and said, how are we delivering services that really reflect the sense of place or the different cultures in our area? 
as we develop people, so identity, um, their belonging in a city, what makes an area. We talk to a lot of people over a number of years, how they have identity and belonging, and how we can then deliver services while understanding at a much greater level people's sort of, not desires, but their real real interactions of a city and what makes ticks for them, rather than making assumptions about about people. And I took the, so we, it really, the work really talked about how people delivering services need to understand routes. That's now, again, this is in the States, the um, use of the word routes or route, I think. So it's like roots of a tree. People talked about identifying a sense of place, about wanting to have a belonging and identity. But often for older people, they felt pushed out as regeneration in Manchester wasn't for them. So they felt a sense of placelessness and asked why this was happening. And the other part of roots or route, so the uh, American context, was understanding the journey that people took, like the cultural backgrounds, histories, and how that was built into the planning of the city, say in festivals or cultures or libraries or community centres. Um, we talked a lot about identity being a really important point about the city and the side of a sense of place, people wanting to feel their de identity but also how they could learn other people's identities. So it's really understanding at a different level, and maybe sometimes a bit of a philosoph philosophical level. The guy in New Zealand was a surfer, and he used to sit out on a surfboard um, out in the Coromandel in New Zealand and that, and kind of just contemplate life while sitting on board. And I guess part of the sense of place work was trying to enable people and then think, OK, how are we really inclusive in this approach? And I've got a number of PDFs which I can send people. They're quite big if people emailed me. Um, the Sense of Place work in Manchester, which was over 2006 to 2008. And now we're bringing it into the work. We, did, we brought it into the intergenerational work. And we're trying to continue that in the age-friendly city. I'm not sure if I quite answered that, but hopefully that gets the idea about this idea of a sense of place. OK, and Patrick, we're just going, we have a few more questions. We're just going to ask one more question because we have some slides that we want to go through. Um, and I'll also talk a little, little bit about our awards, but I, I would encourage you to say Manchester and with that plan, Rock City is unique to me. <laughs> um, well, I think it's a think of I think it's a book in national and it's enables written in many within communities is community development office but designed with uh, and but also to design as challenge the time. It's I think it's unique for we develop partnerships with better academic sector. They use this nail like on the background designing the ship thing. That could be wrong. I think it is, is unique to Manchester. And we've been lucky and um, and also, you know, good personality and all the rest of it. But I think that could be replicable, and I think it's an incredibly exciting area. So sharing the city and now the design lab. I'd, I'd go for that. And there's just two specific questions about that design. To come to the project with the design and training. The, um, both of the designs are graduates already. So some of them, now this is where my throw people it's they're like textiles graduates or um, arts for different arts graduates. So it's more about design approaches. 
So, um, for example, one of the students before they started with us worked with a range of community members. So instead of giving pictures, they did objects of their life. So we had drug users, we had alcoholics, homeless people, all sorts of things. People are often stigmatized in community next to, I don't know, respectable traditional people. Um, so yeah, instead of giving faces, they had images of their lives. And the idea was to try to challenge stereotypes of different age groups. And that was an exhibition. And then that student continued to work with those community members to develop pieces of art and a book and a story. So that's what I mean by design. But in, in Charlton, they're doing, for example, work around bench design or pavements. And like, for example, when cars park up on streets, they're designing these fake parking tickets with a poem on, which people can book on saying how, how this has caused a problem for me to get past. So it's kind of using arts responses in a community development way. The architecture students were more around the physical design, say, of um, a, a St. Peter's Square or um, a shopping centre. So it was more the physical design. So that was the difference. But put the two together, and you've, so far the design lab students' work hasn't influenced anything, but it's only two months old. And the architecture work has its, uh, for example, influenced how the provision of allotments, but in other areas it hasn't. So it's, it's been a real mix. Good. Thank you, Patrick. I might have uh, just confused people completely there. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll stay on at the end for some more questions. And I'm happy um, to email as well. Well, that's really important. I should really give my manchester email on this. So what we're going to do now is move back over to the Generations United component, and we'll do a little wrap-up, and then we'll have the opportunity for more questions for Patrick on the, on the back end. We're going to talk a little bit about our new awards program here at Generations United. I'm Leah Bradley, um, and myself and my colleague Sherry, who introduced the webinar in the beginning, are both working on this, which is the Best Intergenerational Communities Awards. Um, on our website right now, we have an application up there, so we would encourage you to learn more about this new awards program as well as, if appropriate, download and complete the application. But basically, this awards program is sponsored by the MetLife Foundation, and we will be recognizing up to five communities with our first ever Best Intergenerational Communities Awards. We're going to select those communities based on standard criteria that will take into account a community's own demographics services, programs, and organizational structure. So those communities will be recognized for their intergenerational successes. We're not going to be comparing applicants to one another. And so in this award, we are defining community as geographic areas with defined borders and resident populations for which reliable data is available. So we're looking at examples such as metropolitan areas, cities, towns, counties, zip codes, neighborhoods, and school districts, individual organizations or living care facilities are not eligible for recognition. Thinking back over what Patrick has just discussed in terms of age-friendly, we're looking for places that provide adequately for the safety, health, education, and basic necessities of life but they also promote programs, policies, and practices that increase cooperation, interaction, and exchange between people of different generations, as well as enable all ages to share their talents and resources and support each other in relationships that benefit individuals and their community. So we're really looking at places that provide for everybody, but also have that extra component that makes it a place that all generations are welcome and are able to share their, their talents. We want a place where, where individuals of all ages are integral and valued part of the setting. So any community is, in the United States is eligible to apply for this. The application has to be completed by a community member along with 
a local official. And the application will be verified and signed by that official. And those officials could include a government official, a neighborhood association president, a county executive, or other types of official report are in what you turn in by January thirty. And the winning communities are going to to get quite a bit by being selected as a community, such as there's going to be a public recognition event in Washington, D.C., which will include visits with co members of Congress. There will be national and local media exposure, a profile on the Generations United website, and all kinds of additional publicity. In addition, there will be recognition at the 2013 Generations United International Conference as well as technical assistance on intergenerational practice and advocacy. So to do this new awards program, and we hope that you will explore the website, look at the application. If you have any questions whatsoever about the application or your eligibility, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email is right here on your screen. And I'm happy to answer any questions before you start the process while you're engaged in the process. But we are just really excited to be able to do this new awards program and really recognize communities. So if you have any immediate questions now, feel free to, e to send it through this question on the webinar or feel free to contact me at another time. Great. We also just wanted to take a couple of seconds here to um, to, to share some additional resources and program development resources. Uh, we know that uh, we've shared in the past, and if you're not aware, that Penn State University has a number of free resources about intergenerational programming and activity that are available on their website, as well as just to encourage um, folks to either consider submitting their great intergenerational work to the Journal of Intergenerational Relationships and subscribing because it's really a, a wonderful resource for um, uh, inspiration, academic pieces, program profiles from, um, from around the world. So specifically some intergenerational community resources. Patrick's already talked about the Best Johnson Foundation and actually provided sort of their Center for Intergenerational Practice being a probably a better link here, but we also just wanted to, uh, to uh, share a couple of other resources that are available in, in this area on this topic. The Communities for All Ages initiative has a website, um, the www.communitiesforallages.org. Um, that's around the work that Nancy Hankin and Temple University are doing um, on Communities for All Ages. That's a great uh, resource and it lists some of the communities around the, the United States that are doing Community for All Ages work. Also a couple other links here um, that are shared for some, some, there is actually one of the World Health Organization links for the age-friendly cities, the Blueprint from Action by N4A and the Partners, Partners for Livable Communities. Um, AARP has developed a Livable Communities Guide as well as the um, Just Partners out of Baltimore has a Viable Futures Toolkit. All of these resources are available on these websites and are, are really helpful in, in, in this work. Just for you to, again, to mark your calendar and save the dates, our awards deadline for the Best Intergenerational Communities is January 31st. We'll be, there's a quick turnaround and we'll be notifying folks in February with an event in March to, to really kick off the event. Um, we have two webinars currently scheduled, the January and February webinars. On January 23rd, we're going to be working with the National Center for Creative Aging and Elder Share the Arts to present on intergenerational arts program. And then on February 16th, um, we'll be doing evaluation with Kevin Brabazon and Suzanne Sepperson 
um, from New from New York. Uh, these are all Eastern Standard Time, so it's Washington D.C. time that we're ske that they're scheduled, and um, those will always be listed on our website, which you've just seen again. There's a, a calendar function right there, and that's where we advertise all future webinars or events. Um, all Generations United resources you can find through the resources tab, and again, we try to provide as much for free as possible. Uh, just to close out, that we do offer a weekly email alert that for signing for participating in the webinar that you'll be signed up for. You can always opt out if you don't want to receive them, um, and you'll receive those as well as we have a group on Facebook, a uh, networking group that we're for folks that are trying to share ideas and, and intergenerational practices, as well as we're on Twitter and YouTube. And again, this is the contact information for us here at Generations United. We are um, happy to be as, as whatever assistance we can provide, um, and feel free to contact us through email or the phone. And I just also want to take just a second again to thank Patrick for joining us all the way from England today. Um, love the te technology that allows to happen and um, for all of you for joining and may well get to you that as a community that I think on that a lot of practice is a key connect to both with younger people with our boys um, who's doing work in the city and the I'm going to say yes, I think this gives you a really, really good opportunity work in the So, helps a well. to look at as two parts. One, you that have facilitated it, offers enable to interact 
to not for needs of the state to require him to get into it to write a thing so the syllabus has compliance we can't come to write back now it's based of the moon in the which sits in the vein generation that make use of space but it's it's if you talking with then I think the clues and I think if you see center in that that you need people who are trying to bring Person, how we even from the they were not surely well, they were into a way greater and not all how Thank you. Thank you. Good time. Everyone. Any 